Good evening, everyone. My name is Mo Harrington. I am the Assistant Director of Development here at ACR Health. And welcome to the 23rd Annual Hike for Life, where we are doing 23 days of wellness agenda, and we're celebrating 23 years of the Hike for Life. Uh, we have had an amazing time reintroducing our agency to the community. And tonight, we are going to be talking about the Q Center, one of my all-time favorite things uh, in our all-time favorite programs here at uh, the uh, at ACR Health. It is a safe space for LGBTQ youth, and we have some uh, wonderful guests this evening. Uh, we have Karen Fuller. She is the credited, um, I'm sorry, the, we have Karen Fuller, the credentialed family and peer advocate. We have Talia Shenandoah, Q Center Youth Development Specialist. And we are also joined tonight by Ashley Davis, who is the Q Center Youth Coordinator. So I want to give you guys a little bit of background of the Q Center, first of all. The Q Center started about 10 years after ACR Health became a nonprofit organization. So we're celebrating our 37th year this year. So if you can imagine 27 years ago, and there were some youth that needed a safe space to kind of land and be supportive of each other. And they didn't have any place that they thought was safe in the community. They were meeting um, at the bottom of a church in the basement of a church, but um, they just didn't feel like it was the safest space. So we opened up at ACR Health, uh, we opened up a room in the back of our main office. And very soon, I'm gonna say about a month later, uh, Michael Crinan, who was the then um, executive director at ACR Health, knew almost immediately that this space was not nearly going to be big enough or um, we couldn't really take care of the LGBTQ youth community as well as we knew that we could. So Michael Crinan at the time went to Frank Lazarski, who was the president of the United Way, and met with him and told him the need in our community and how many kids had been coming to our office. And so Frank, seeing the need in the community, decided to fund a standalone Q Center, which is our Central New York uh, Q Center that now resides um, on Hiawatha Boulevard. So um, we are very, very grateful always to the United Way for seeing that need and in spite of many um, stigmatizing things that they could have come up against, they funded us and didn't even think twice about it. And now we have three different Q centers located in Utica, one in Utica, one in Watertown, and one in Syracuse. So um, what is the Q center? So we wanna start with a little video that um, Talia Shenandoah, who is the Q center youth development specialist made for us. So let's hear from Talia. Good evening from your friends at the Q Center. The Q Center is an LGBTQ plus youth center through ACR Health that provides programs and services to youth, young adults, and families. We are located in Syracuse, Watertown, and Utica. Through these locations, we serve a total of nine counties, including Onondaga, Oswego, Cayuga, Madison, Oneida, Herkimer, Lewis, Jefferson, and St. Lawrence counties. Our programming provides safe and supportive spaces to LGBTQ plus youth, allies, and families. We provide resources that cultivate pride and leadership skills, and we are working to create a safer community for youth. Taking a look at our programs, we are currently offering the Young Men's Project, a program that provides HIV and AIDS prevention and education for gay men or men attracted to other men ages 13 to 29. Through this program, you can receive free and confidential HIV and STI testing. We currently offer rapid testing for HIV, hepatitis C, and syphilis. You can get on-site results within 10 to 20 minutes depending on the test type, and we can also collect urine samples to screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Most results are received back within a week, and any appropriate treatment referrals can be made by our staff. A unique attribute of the Q Center is our credentialed family peer advocate, Karen, who specializes in working with families of transgender youth. 
She is able to meet with families of LGBTQ plus youth one-to-one -to, -one to help assess needs and link to appropriate additional resources. Our family peer advocate can help by answering questions and offering education, assist with name and gender marker changes, provide advocacy in schools, and offer support groups for parents of trans youth on a weekly basis. Groups are currently operating virtually until further notice. Please check back on our return to in-person services. Q Center staff is able to offer case management services on an as-needed basis for LGBTQ plus youth ages 13 to 29. Common services young people need or seek assistance with include housing, advocacy, health insurance, medical care, mental health services, or other special needs. The Q also houses the Comprehensive Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program in our Syracuse location. This program features a team of five educators who are equipped with evidence-based interventions to provide sexual and reproductive health education in schools and privately at the Q on occasion. Our target population includes youth ages 10 to 21, and in addition to our evidence-based curriculum, our program also creates and facilitates inclusive programming that helps to build life skills in young people. While this program is specific to Onondaga County, our agency response to the pandemic has allowed for CAP to provide education and programming beyond our traditional service area and into additional regions of central New York through a virtual format. Our newest and most exciting venture includes our YouTube channel called The Sexperts, where you can find fun and educational videos and take a closer look at CAP programming. The Q Center at ACR Health is also home to the LGBTQ Plus Youth Rapid Rehousing Program, which is specific to Onondaga County. This program primarily serves chronically homeless LGBTQ plus youth between the ages of 18 to 24 who are coming from shelter. The program provides rental assistance, case management, and life skills workshops to help young people obtain self-sufficiency. Supportive case management services are available post-program for up to 30 months. Please note this program does not operate outside of the Syracuse area. ACR Health offers unique scholarship opportunities awarded twice per year in the spring and fall under the Eddie's Future Greatness Award. Four youth between the ages of 16 to 26 are chosen to receive a $500 award to support their higher education. The student must be registered in an accredited post-secondary institution, and application deadlines fall on the 16th of March and September for spring and fall semesters. Please visit www.acrhealth.org for more information on how to apply. And last, but certainly not least, the Q Center is dedicated to community outreach and education across all regions. Staff is able to provide LGBTQ plus cultural competency trainings for youth and adults in a multitude of settings from school to school administration to community-based organizations, healthcare settings, faith-based settings, and more in an effort to promote affirming and supportive environments and to build community for LGBTQ plus individuals. Q Center staff is also able to offer school staff technical assistance regarding gender and sexuality alliances or LGBTQ plus focused extracurricular clubs. Please connect with us if you are interested by calling area code 315-475-2430. Programming has changed a bit in the last year and ACR Health has maintained commitment to following COVID guidelines to keep our communities safe while still working hard to meet their needs however possible. Our Q Center programming is all operating completely virtual until further notice. While a slow return to in-person services is anticipated soon, we will be taking our time rolling out programming to ensure the most strategic ways to keep our communities safe. Currently, we are offering weekly virtual support groups for LGBTQ plus youth and allies ages 13 to 25, weekly virtual support groups for parents of transgender and gender expansive youth, cultural competency trainings, gender and sexuality alliance support in schools, and care management for youth.
We're accepting referrals into our programs and anyone interested can find our referral form under the Youth and Family Services portion of the ACR Health website at www.acrhealth.org. When a new youth would like to join the Q Center, they must first connect with our program coordinator to complete our intake paperwork and go over our code of conduct via Zoom. Once the youth is officially a Q Center member, they will receive weekly email updates as to what is happening that week, and they may choose to participate in any group within the specified range that matches their age. They will receive the link to join our Zoom meeting via email, and once they enter, they will be asked to participate in circle time, either formally through speaking or informally through utilizing the chat feature. Each youth provides an introduction to familiarize themselves with their peers. Groups are approximately an hour in length, are socially supportive in nature, and often include guest presenters, skill building topics, health and wellness presentations, facilitated sessions for creative expression, and sometimes even interactive events or games. Our groups are currently meeting on Tuesdays from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. for young adults ages 18 to 25. Wednesdays from 4 to 5 p.m. for LGBTQ plus youth and allies ages 13 to 18. On the first and third Thursday of each month from 5 to 6 p.m. for black, indigenous, and other youth of color ages 13 to 25 or on the second Saturday of the month at 1 p.m. for our Q Kids group offered for LGBTQ plus or gender expansive youth ages 12 and under. To contact us, you can email qcentercny at acrhealth.org, or you can call our main line at 315-475-2430 and ask to speak to staff at the Q Center. You can find our monthly calendars with events and topics listed, posted regularly on our social media. Please find the Q Center at ACR Health on Facebook and like our page. We are also on Instagram at the Q Center underscore at underscore ACR Health. Connect with us on social media to stay up to date on what is happening next. was wonderful. Thank you, Talia. That was really fantastic. And it just gives a really overall uh, of all of the programs at the Q Center. And I know that I've been working uh, at ACR Health for 10 years. I started out as a development associate specifically for the Q Center. And uh, at the time, one of our volunteers was a mom of one of our youth, um, Karen Fuller, who is now a credentialed family peer advocate, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, and one of the um, foremost experts, I think, on, um, on our transgender youth for our transgender parents and is an amazing resource for our community. Um, Karen, I want to bring you into the um, conversation as well as Ash, if I can. Um, if you guys could give me, uh, us, our, our audience, a little bit of background on how you came to find the Q Center and, um, and what exactly a credentialed family peer advocate does. Sure. Um, so as Mo said, I um, found the Q Center basically because of one of my kids um, who actually started transition at seven and he is now 22. Um, so of course we were out there looking for support um, and luckily found the Q Center. Um, and soon after he started attending, I started volunteering um, and I just fell in love with ACR and all they had to offer and all they do for the community um and thankfully was you know after several years offered a position so um a family peer advocate basically works with um parents uh the big thing is that um they have similar experiences raising their own children so they're able to help um parents and caregivers on a more, you know, um, peer-based, uh, you know, um, level. So, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to go to a support group that's offered through, um, you know, a counselor or a mental health professional. And another one, you know, another experience to 
go to a support group that's run by somebody that's actually been in the same situation you've been, um, you know, and it, as well as getting other supports. So um, typically what happens is I either hear, you know, have parents referred to by schools or um, some parents just, you know, find our information um, and I get emails or calls. Um, and usually what I do is I set up a time to meet with a parent and caregiver one-on-one, -on -one, um, kind of get to know more about their situation, where they're coming from, um, answer any of the questions that they have, um, and then go over how our parent groups work um, and you know just gather some information. Um, and then they're welcome to attend our parent groups. So parent groups right now, we meet virtually every Wednesday. Um, we start, uh, we have two different time slots. Uh, so that gives parents some kind of flexibility on when they're able to attend. So we have a 1230 to 130 time slot or a six to 730. Um, we had to expand our evening um, time. It used to be an hour, now it's an hour and a half because we do get so many parents that come to the evening group. Um, and group is just really, you know, it's a place where parents can go to um, express how they are feeling and you know any questions or fears that they might have with how their child is identifying um, and kind of rearm themselves to get out there to be the best advocate for their child. So it gives them space where they can just really um, be free to express themselves without risk of upsetting their child or making, you know, having their child think that they're not supportive or that, you know, they're causing their parents stress. So that's really important, you know, to, for parents to be able to have that space. Um, and then what, what I love about group is the parents, I have parents that have continued to come, they're like, you know, three, four years into the transition process. So they're able to help new parents along. Um, and though, you know, we all have similar experiences, there are those difference. So maybe for, you know, someone coming in, coming in with a young child that's, you know, transitioning like, you know, um, an elementary school age, uh, then I can relate to that parent. But for a parent coming in with uh, a teenager starting the transition process, one of our other parents would have a similar experience. So that really helps to, to hear from just a variety of people and, you know, such a, um, large group um but you know that's a, that's got to be a very scary thing right people coming in they don't have the information and that is a very scary thing i mean you've got a child who who knows who they are for the first time and and to be accepting i mean and i know you know because i i mean i knew you at a very you know years ago and you were incredibly accepting of your child is that would you say that that's the the norm, I mean, of, of the kids that walk through our door, the parents that walk through our door, because that's gotta be a very difficult situation. Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to say, because I do know a lot of youth that don't have that, that support. Um, but if I can get the parent to even, you know, just, you know, meet with me, um, even if they're not sure and they're not interested in group. But sometimes what happens, you know, that I see are, you know, parents have fears, right? They have their child's, you know, um, well-being in mind. So they don't necessarily mean to, you know, not be supportive, but because they're so fearful of, you know, you know, who will love my child? You know, how will society accept my child? What will happen to my child in school? You know, they're worrying about all these things. So sometimes it's just a matter of talking to somebody that's been through it and kind of explaining, you know, you know, answering these, addressing these fears and answering their questions, then they are on the road to being more supportive. So some do need, you know, a little encouragement, but we do, unfortunately, we do have some parents that, um, you know, are not engaged and the youth find us on their own. Um, you know, and we become that huge support system for them. Um, so I'm always grateful that we're here. You know, we have the youth, um, youth team, so. So you're a mother to a lot of kids. Yes, yeah. 
<laughs> I see Ash over there, uh, you know, shaking the head. So Ash, you want to tell a little bit about what you do at the Q Center and introduce yourself? Yeah, so I am Ashley Davis. Um, I'm the program coordinator at the CNYQ Center, um, so the one here in Syracuse. Um, and I do, so, okay, what I do is much different um, than it probably used to be. Um, I came on during the pandemic. Um, everything was already shut down. Um, so everything that I've done is, is completely virtual. Um, so probably much different than what it used to be and what it maybe used to look like, but I facilitate um, the, the youth groups for the ages 13 to 25 year olds, the Tuesday night and the Wednesday night one. Um, I do intakes with the youth. Um, I do uh, a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head, but um, certainly um, I've never been in a, in a physical Q Center um, group. So um, I do look forward to that. <laughs> That's wonderful. And so how did you come to the Q Center? How did you find the Q Center specifically? Um, yeah, so I'd heard about it when I was a youth. I grew up here in Syracuse and I'd, I'd heard about it, but I um, never really checked it out. I was a really shy kid and I was like, I had sports and that was enough for me at, back then. But um, when I graduated from Lemoyne, I was uh, just job hunting. My dad actually sent me the listing um, that you guys had posted. And so I applied and then um, it was, it was kind of a process because it was also, you guys are in the middle of shutting down, um, <laughs> and, and, and working from home. So, but what does, uh, what has, what has COVID done? So have you seen numbers rise, Karen, or have you seen people kind of, you know, Ash, have you, have you seen people like kind of hunker down and not think that they need support groups or, you know, what has been the current, you know, COVID climate around, uh, our attendance, even virtually for the Q Center? So for the parent end of things, uh, my numbers have increased. Uh, I used to get one to two new families per month and now it would average out to one to two new families uh, or two to three new families a week. Wow. So a huge increase, um, whether that's because, you know, the, the kids were at home more often with their parents and the parents really, you know, saw the impact that, you know, um, this, you know, how their child was identifying that on them, or that more youth started to feel more comfortable to start their transition process because they weren't going into school. Um, but definitely have seen an increase. I also, the other change that I, I saw, have seen through um, COVID is that parent group used to be very, very trans specific, but, you know, the parents needed to talk about other issues like, you know, having to all of a sudden homeschool their kids or just the stress of the pandemic. Um, of course, around election time, there were a lot of uh, conversations um, on the election and, you know, the, the different candidates. So, you know, it's, it's become a space that's not only just um, for parents to come in and talk about um, what's going on their, with their child's transition, but also a space where they can talk about other things that are going on in their life. Nice. Ash, what have you seen as far as trends in attendance and what um, COVID has done? Yeah, so um, what I've noticed is that we get a lot of, um, now the, the youth groups serve all nine counties at once rather than like the individual cities where the centers were. And so they get to mingle with kids um, that maybe are out of their region um, and, and get to know kids that are across the state that are like them. Um, I've noticed that a lot of the kids that come now are, more, are from more rural areas that maybe wouldn't have had the access normally to the Q Center and, and some of our services. Um, so that's definitely um, a big difference. But I also have noticed that, that a lot of them um, don't really um, turn on their cameras as much. And you can tell sometimes it felt more like an extracurricular when they've been on Zoom all day long. The last thing they wanted to do was come Zoom with me, but I think I'm fun. So I'm hoping they've come <laughs> around to it. So um. well, this will <laughs> definitely show them, you know, how fun you are. So <laughs> yeah. 
That's amazing. So, you know, it's really interesting that you say that about the rural uh, communities, because those communities, I think, even as a fundraiser, really worry us because, you know, there is no, uh, you know, major transportation. The mental health facilities are, and the mental health, you know, resources are very low. So the fact that we have this opportunity, I think, to have them on a Zoom call or in a virtual reality is, is really amazing, I think, because we were able to reach out to so many more of the kids on a much bigger basis, which I love. So thank you for sharing that. That's very happy. You know, that makes me very happy. Um, Karen, so I have a question from uh, someone who's in attendance. And uh, he says, my daughter came out in fourth grade and now she's 34. What have you seen? What kind of changes have you seen from when you first started this work? advocating for youth and how it is now? Um, so one of the biggest things is that more people have heard of transgender or gender expansive individuals. So there's a, you know, it's out there more often. Um, and a lot of times uh, the parent we, and group, we talk about how you can see that representation starting a lot in the media now. A lot of TV shows have a trans or gender expansive character. So that's definitely something that we have seen um, even from the years since my son started his transition to now, um, you know, when he started, there was nothing out there. And even though we did, you know, find the Q Center at the time, you know, again, he started at age seven, um, Q Center was still only serving 13 and up. Um, thankfully, I kept in contact and by the time he was nine, they said, okay, we're going to start a cute kids group and we're going to, you know, get going with that. So um, just, you know, now you can easily, you know, with the internet and everything, you can find information, you can find other support groups, you can find, you know, providers, though providers are seriously lacking and there's a lot of travel that would be required for a lot of individuals, especially in the rural areas. So I think that's overall that just more people understand it's not something that, you know, um, they might not have an understanding of what it really means, but they've heard the term transgender before. I think that that's a really um, cool thing because it just reminds me of how ACR Health in general will see an, an, a need and fill it. So, exactly. you know, opening up the Q Center, you know, just literally for a place where kids could talk and then realizing that the services that we had at the Q Center or at the at the main office, things like housing and food and and, you know, travel and transportation, things like that were needed by our youth as well. So we kind of had that opportunity. And one of the things that I've loved seeing for the past 10 years is how the programming at the Q Center has expanded. So I know that you guys have a new group called QT of Color. Can you guys tell me a little bit about that? Because that's that's brand new. It sounds fascinating. Yes. Um, so that is for um, all of our uh, queer and transgender um, uh, youth uh, of color. Um, and so we have started, we, we noticed a need. Um, and we are trying to fill it the best we can. Um, so we have partnered with Black Q's Pride um, uh, to help us facilitate that group. Um, and so we are very excited about it and we are hoping that it really takes off and fills, up, fills out that need very well. You know, for a city the size of Syracuse, the fact that we have CNY Pride, we have Black Q's Pride, we have the Q Center, we have, um, you know, SAGE, which is for older LGBTQ adults, uh, there are a lot of resources. And so if you are needing any kind of resources in just the LGBTQ um, community, the Q Center is also a good place to reach out to for any resource for any age. So I do want to point that out too. So I know, Karen, you're talking about things like, you know, we're, we're kind of being, you know, people now are expanding their language. They, they are, you know, learning more about um, transgender youth and the transgender community and people are starting to kind of even use the right language, which we're always very excited about, um, you know, use proper pronouns and even do that kind of uncomfortable thing of even asking, mm -hmm. you know, which I think for some people is, is uncomfortable, but I would rather have somebody ask me than, than not know. And I, I don't think that there's anybody that you would even ask 
that would feel uncomfortable answering that question because I think they're just so grateful to be to be asked. You know, it's nice, right? It's nice to have that. Yes, that definitely. Ask. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I do want to ask because I do know that we see a lot of LGBTQ characters on television, which is wonderful, but you know, there is still a lot of hardships and a lot of walls that I think that our community or that the LGBTQ community has to face every day, especially this last administration that was in office. We've seen a lot of those transgender um, bans and uh, bans on healthcare kind of come up in, uh, you know, in, in a lot of different courtrooms, which has been very, very frightening for a lot of our youth. Um, so I know that you guys talk a little bit about that, um, I'm sure, in support groups. Um, and I also wanted to mention that you, well, we also, as the Q Center, used to go to Albany every year, and we would advocate for something. And I'm pretty proud to say that our Q kids had a lot to do with marriage equality. Yes. So, you know, talk a little bit about their kind of grass, grassroots advocacy when it comes to um, the things that they see going on around them and how they can actually be a voice that changes what they see. Yeah, so definitely that was always, um, I always loved going to Albany and doing that trip with the youth because, you know, we would get some that, and they were great. They would they would go in and they would speak to their, their representatives and the ad adults, we would sit back and let them speak. And, and sometimes I think it's better for, you know, people in those uh, higher positions to really hear from the youth and, and, and get it, it makes a bigger impact. Um, you know, and even like during the summer last summer, I know some of our youth wanted to, you know, um, take part in, you know, the marches and stuff that were going on, um, you know, uh, for Black Lives Matter and different things like that. And we do, we listen to what, you know, any issue that comes up that's really important to the youth, we encourage them and try to find a way that they can, you know, they can advocate and then, you know, any way we can assist them in that. So. And one thing that we didn't talk about is the pride prom. <laughs> can we talk about pride prom and why we started the pride prom to begin with? So pride prom um, came about because of course we wanted to, um, you know, make a prom that you know, the youth could come to where they could come with the partner that they chose to come with and dress how they wanted to dress and express themselves, you know, in, in the way that made them comfortable. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able, we had one all set to go and then COVID hit. Um, and this year we're still working on trying to plan reopening. So it doesn't look like we are going to have one this year. Um, I don't think we've really discussed it. Maybe we could work something out later <laughs> than we normally would. But, uh, you know, again, it's open to all LGBTQ youth. It doesn't matter if they're a Q Center member or not. We open it to the GSAs and the, the schools um, and try and get the word out there um, and get, you know, um, we try and make it formal um, as we can, you know, like a traditional prom. I know a couple of years we, we kind of got away from that, but we're hoping to get it more back to the traditional where, you know, they can have that experience because that is a milestone experience that a lot of youth really enjoy having. Is. Well, it definitely is. It's a rite of passage. And one of the things that I love is that there are so many older LGBTQ um, community members who didn't get to experience the prom the way that they wanted to. And so they come as chaperones. Yeah. And so it's really wonderful to see them embrace it just as much. You know, they wear their tuxedos yeah. and their prom dresses and they get their corsages. And it's, it's just a really, I mean, you know, volunteers, it's really wonderful for our volunteers to even come out and, uh, and experience that as well. So Absolutely. that's really great. Can you talk a little bit about when this, um, when the Q Center opens? Um, we also have a program where people from the community can actually come into the Q Center. Now, when I first started at the Q Center, the Q Center was closed. It was a closed space. So the community members really weren't allowed to come into the Q Center or even be involved in any part of the support groups at all. 
And then we started, you started uh, at the Q Center, a program called the Sit Down Dinner Initiative, where members of the community come in, they bring um, food to prepare, teach the kids how to make a meal, one of their favorite meals, and then also um, sit down and have dinner with them and experience a support group. Uh, tell me how important that is to have uh, to have the youth sit down and have dinner with as a family. Yeah, so that's absolutely important, um, especially, you know, if we have youth that don't get that experience at home, you know, it's something nice. And plus it, it helps them tie into other uh, adults in the community. Um, and, you know, so that's good, especially if the adults that are coming in identify as LGBTQ themselves, that you know, provides just an additional role model, you know, so these youth can look at, you know, well, here's an individual, you know, that's successful in life and they've made it through and therefore, you know, um, that gives them hope that that they'll too, you know, make it through. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's just a good experience overall for the youth and the people that come in and would do that. Um, we don't necessarily have them sit in and on actual support groups, um, but like in that situation, it's more of an open thing. And I think what changed was, you know, again, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, people uh, who identify as gay or lesbian, bisexual, um, they, in the community, again, it's more acceptable. Um, so I think that the generation now coming through um, where, you know, when the queue first opened, it was closed because it was more of, you know, privacy and everything. And now um, it's more acceptable. So, so therefore a lot of the youth now um, that are coming out, they're, they're okay with other people coming in and, and visiting or, you know, seeing the queue or, um, you know, and, and open to having that. So I That's don't know really if cool. Ash had anything else she wanted to add. <laughs> Ash, we can't wait for you to experience one of the sit-down dinners. They're oh. really, really fun. So I just have a really quick story. The very first time we ever did one of the sit-down dinners, we had a very um, traditional Italian couple come in. And she was very excited because she wanted to uh, make this old-fashioned Italian dinner. You know, her grandmother's sauce and her grandmother's meatballs, and she made all the ingredients. And the kids came and they made the meatballs and the sauce and the pasta, and it was fantastic. Her husband was a little bit more conservative and so came in and said to one of the kids in the kitchen, you know, I don't, I don't understand this. Like, I just don't understand this. I don't understand who you are. You know, can you just tell me like, what, what, what is this? And this, um, and it was very funny. We had a, and, and uh, he was talking to one of our um, transgender youth and she just said, well, what do you want to know? And he said, well, what's your name? And when she came out with her name, it was the same name as his granddaughter. And it was like this, immediately, just like this, this connection was made. By the end of the night, they were hugging. They'd exchanged phone numbers. If you need anything, let me know. I'm here for you. We're family. And it was just this most amazing thing. And they stayed in contact for a while. It was really, it was really amazing. And it was just that that exchange of food and conversation and an openness that was really wonderful. So whenever I think about uh, the sit down dinner initiative, I always think of, I always think of that night because that was a little scary <laughs> that yeah. night because you never know how a youth is going to, you know, respond. And um, turns out they, uh, they responded probably better than the adult did. So I was really, really, I was really proud that night. It was wonderful. Um, I also don't want to don't want to leave out the fact that um, you know high school dropout uh, rates are still increased, and suicide rates are still increased, and they have poor body image. LGBTQ youth have poor body image, and there's a higher instance of homelessness. And we don't also want to forget that those are the reasons why we have the Q Center as well, because it's not not everyone's parents accept except where they are. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those other care management services and even um, mental health services and the testing that we have in the Q Center that help the kids get through those kinds of moments? Ash, did you wanna 
start that now. No, you can you can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> right. So yeah, so basically, as you said earlier, you know, when we see need, the agency sees a need, we try and fill that need. And that's where a lot of our programming, like our um, housing for LGBTQ youth and um, our testing, um, our young men's project came from is that we saw that our youth needed, you know, needed these programs. So a lot of times, um, you know, that's what where it starts from is what we see. Um, what else did you ask? <laughs> well, I asked about, you know, the mental health services and even the health services. So we had um, infectious disease doctor uh, uh, AC uh, Demidon come in for one of our talks and she was really wonderful. And she talked a lot about how coming up um, as a transgender female that she, and even being a doctor, that there were so many things that would happen, that so many needs that she needed when she would go to a doctor that she wasn't getting. So I think that that's kind of what, what pushed her into the medical field herself. And uh, William had an opportunity to uh, meet with her. Very interesting because there are so many people that are going into the medical field that are finally realizing that there, there are other uh, needs right, in the transgender community, especially when yeah. it comes to just going to a doctor, because that shouldn't be a barrier to getting health. No, no, absolutely not. So we so are we, also a resource there. Yes, yeah, so definitely, and that's part of, you know, the work that we all do. So uh, obviously, if the parent is, is involved and the youth is under 18, then it you know, I work with the parents on finding providers, you know, whether it be a mental health provider or a medical doctor that, you know, is trained and, you know, is um, LGBTQ supportive and affirming. So um, all the providers that we, you know, use are ones that were recommended from youth and families that have come before. So in that, um, you know, we do have a resource guide. It's on the um, ACR Health website um, that, is updated very frequently um, in order to, you know, have that resource for individuals. Um, and if they're under 18, that's where, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if they're over 18, that's where Ashley and Talia come in with their um, care management and they're able to make those connections for the youth if they need to find a mental health provider or a medical doctor. Um, so, but it is, uh, you know, um, it, it can be really hard to navigate and try and find somebody, especially if you get into more complex, you know, situations where a youth might have not only be trans, but they also might have other mental health, um, you know, um, things going on. So they want to find, you know, a provider that can understand all, you know, the whole puzzle, not just one part. So um, we're able to do that for them. And then we can, you know, refer in house, you know, as well. So um, we help have sometimes we pull in health homes and, you know, have them help. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we can refer to the other programs at ACR um, if we need to. Um, for, for trans individuals that um, use testosterone, they're able to go to our clinic if they need to. They can go to our insurance ex exchange program to get their needles um, and their um, containers. Uh, so, you know, we can all tie in um, our services for the youth um, with, with the ACR as a whole, which is really great. That's really wonderful. It is nice to remember that all of the services that ACR Health and the wraparound services that ACR Health provide are also available for all of our youth at our, at our um, Q Center facilities as well, and that all of our services are free. Yes. That yes. is a very important point too. Yeah. And all of our services are for free. So right. um, what, are, what are some of the barriers that you've seen uh, during COVID um, that you didn't normally see when the Q Center was opened? Ash, do you wanna take that one? Um, yeah, I can try. Um, I don't know how much services we needed um, bef before COVID. Um, but um, I know even even today, I think I had an intake with a youth um, that was very fresh and new, just coming out, um, just coming out to parents. Um, 
I, uh, I, we, we talked a little bit about the services that this individual um, youth in particular needed. Um, and they, they talked very specifically about um, hearing that we had a parent piece. And so I, I, I gave them all of Karen's information. I know you're um, on vacation, but um, it's, <laughs> it'll be sitting there waiting for you. Um, and so that I think um, a lot of kids also um, have been dealing with um, school from home. And, and, and uh, I think that's a big, a big thing is that they've all, they all have different school schedules and um, trying to figure out a time to even come to group in between online algebra and online chemistry. Um, sounds like a nightmare to me, but um, <laughs> just the fact yeah. that they're doing at work is truly incredible to see. That's very interesting. All right, so I want to open up the floor to um, to other guests that we have online to see if anyone has any questions. I also want to say that I'm really uh, excited because we're joined by one of our board members, uh, Jennifer. Um, so please, if you have any questions or anything to ask, although she, she knows the agency pretty well, but I just want to put it out there to everyone. I did have a question from a personal uh, experience that I'm kind of going through now um, with someone who, uh, with a youth that is, I believe he's 14 or 15 and he is identifying himself as gay and he's having a really hard problem between his mother and father uh, that are not, they are not together uh, as a married couple. They don't live in the same household. Um, father is having a lot more struggles with this. Uh, and he's actually on my side of the family. Um, and the mom has kind of, I, I don't know, she hasn't done it, but actions are moving towards the isolating him from the rest of us and the rest of us are kind of like that's your issue <laughs> you know how do I keep myself in included um in the dialogue without um overstepping I, I don't know well like I, I'm kind of stuck on the language now that I should use with my cousin um, because he's kind of got this, I'm washing my hands with this. I don't care if I ever see him again. And I'm kind of like, you know, he's 14. He's going to grow up, <laughs> you know, and he's not going to be 14 forever. And you're not going to, you know, it, it's not this day every day for the rest of his life. It, and and the more angry he gets, the more the mom, because she's trying to support him, right. but kind of have lumped us all together. And now we're on this, I don't wanna say, I, I guess it feels like we're sneaking around, <laughs> you know, like here's my cousin and here we all are <laughs> like, right. Right. sneaking around. But uh, just to, kind of keep the support there for my, um, for my cousin's son, because I know he's going through a lot, you know, mentally for himself, as well as with his parents and trying to balance them. And, and I know I can't uh, necessarily relate to both these situations. I can relate to one, but I can't relate to both of them. Uh, but I just don't want to iso isolate myself from him. And I don't want to, I don't want to take sides. I don't want to take sides of his mom or his dad. And it's, but we still want him, like my husband and I and my son, we still want him to know that that's their problem. <laughs> you know, that, that's not our problem. You know, we're, we're, we're willing to try to, do it without them, you know, be in relationship with you without them. That's okay. Right. And 
just at four, you know, if he was 18, it'd be different. <laughs> you know, yeah. forget about it, you know, but being 14, it's a lot more challenging. Yeah. So I think the most important, like you said, you, you were letting, you know, him know that you were supporting him and, and the tension with the parents, that's one thing, but you're going to be there. Mm. You're, you're there for him. That's very important that he knows that, um, you know, and then as far as your cousin go, um, you know, parents, like I said, it's a lot, sometimes it's a lot of fear. They don't, they don't know what this means. And, and, and it comes out, it's, it's supposed to, stems from a good place they want the best for their kid mm -hmm. and then they start to worry about what that might mean for their their future um and then it's also the change of this vision this dream that they had when they mm -hmm. had their child what that was going to look like and now it's changing and for a lot of people that's very hard so just for him i would just you know not push but just kind of encourage you know maybe you know offer resources or you know connect to try and address those fears but you don't want to try and push because that will just make things worse you know but just like i said you know and sometimes to parents question especially at younger ages i hear a lot like it's a phase it's a trend they don't know they're confused they're too young to know what's going on Adolescence is an, a time in your life when you're trying to figure out who you are and your place in the world and mm -hmm. finding your, you know, identifying your sexual orientation and your gender identity. That's all part of it. But a lot of times parents don't allow for their child to explore that part of themselves because mm -hmm. of the fear, you know, mm -hmm. so like my, my daughter um, because I'm so, you know, in the Q Center, we're all big into the Q Center and into the community. Um, she was able to do that, you know, and I was fine. She identified, she identified as one thing that, you know, and finally found who she is, but she mm. was able to do that. And I think, you know, that has a, plays a major part in a youth's mental health as well when they're able to have that exploration, when they're able to really figure out who they are, that helps them in the future um, to have better mental health and, and more self-esteem. So I would just say, you know, try and try and softly maybe encourage your cousin to look into things or research or, but you don't want to push it too hard because you'll push away, but, you know, definitely let, you know, um, the youth know that this, you know, we're here for you. We're here for you. The tension there, that's them, but we are here for you. So if you ever need anything, you can call us. We're here. We support you. Yeah. Asha, do you want to add anything to that? You're on the right track. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I think Karen um, pretty much nailed it, um, like always. So. <laughs> you know, there is a wonderful book that was written by uh, one of the parents of one of our Q Center youth called Allies and Angels. And it's uh, by Terry Cook. And she talked very intimately about the struggle that she had um, when her son came out, you know, and, and the whole idea, you know, and it was, there were, you know, suicide attempts and there was questioning and there was disappointment and sadness, but there was also a lot of joy and a lot of freedom and a lot of happiness that came after that. And, you know, I'm, I'm friends with this guy on Facebook or on, on LinkedIn and I watch his, his career and he's just doing great. And I'm, you know, so, so incredibly, you know, happy to watch that process. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. And, and it's just like, this is the way it's always supposed to, to have been. So uh, it's a wonderful book. And maybe that's something that you just might want to, you know, sneak on the coffee table or something at some point, you know, I, I'll get you, I'll get you a copy of that. Um, I also wanted to ask, so, so Karen, um, William here, right, right uh, on screen uh, is our JVC um, uh, student for the year. He's been volunteering with us for an entire year in service, um, and it's a lot of service this year. It's been amazing. Uh, <laughs> we thank you very much, William. But here's a guy who's going to be a doctor. Right, he's uh, taking his MCATs and he's going to medical school, and and so what do you want to say to him as 
a medical student, you know, coming up in the world, what, what kind of things would you want to say to him as a parent of someone who has gone through this experience that could possibly make another parent's experience better or easier? Um, so I would say just, you know, be open and listen, uh, you know, of course, to the youth or their parents. Um, you know, if you need, you know, keep up, <laughs> keep up with the community in the terms, um, you know, make sure that wherever you land, when you are in practice, that you make it welcoming for, you know, LGBTQ individuals, you know, whether on your forms, from your forms to your, the reception area, um, you know, you want to make sure that people understand um, the importance of pronouns and using chosen name um, and stuff like that. Uh, but definitely, um, you know, it, what would make it easier, what would have made it easier for me would have been to be able to go to a doctor and for one, you know, for, for our experience, the questions would come to my husband and myself over our son, you know, he'd go in for like a simple sore throat and then they're questioning us on how he identifies and how'd you figure this out and how, you know, and it turned into, this is not what we came for. Um, and I know for a lot of trans and gender expansive individuals, when they go to the doctors, that's the same experience, you know, but it's, it's them, you know, now that my son goes to the doctors himself, you know, he gets that. So absolutely make sure that um, you're not using the time they're coming in to discuss and they have them justify who they are. Wow, that's an, that's intense. That's an intense piece of advice right there. Yeah. <laughs> That is fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ash, do you have anything to, to add to that? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think once again, Karen has hit a mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we are actually at the end of our hour. Um, I am just, it's been a pleasure and an honor to spend this last hour with you getting to know more about uh, specifically our programming, uh, Karen, about your family. Ash, welcome to the team, and thank you so much for working as hard as you do, especially through COVID. We really, really appreciate it. To the guests that are joining us, thank you so much. Um, we are going to continue this 23 days, celebrating 23 years of the Hike for Life, and we look forward to tomorrow night's presentation, which is all about credit. How do we get credit? Credit, you know, how do we get out of bad credit? All kinds of things. We're going to be joined by our 20 year sponsor, uh, Empower Federal Credit Union. Um, how about that for some support? How about that for having you back, which really excites me. So, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye.